Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rebecca Lubert, and I am the Director of Career and Business Engagements with the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. Thank you and welcome to our webinar today, Career Lightning Talks on Job Search Strategies for Students and Recent Alumni. We have a great lineup for you today, and we're excited to get started. So without further ado, we'll keep continue. Um, we'd like to always thank our members and donors of the Alumni Association for powering our alumni webinar series. To learn more about supporting the Alumni Association, you may go to the address listed on your screen. Um, we also have a few upcoming events that you may be interested in, especially if you're in the if you're searching for a job, not sure where to start, or it may be perhaps in the middle of a career transition. You may be interested in our alumni job search masterclass, which is entitled Your Career Journey from Rediscovery to the Job Hunt. And that's presented by Happiness Hunt, which is a career, um, an alumni owned business. And the deadline to register for that this masterclass is Friday, June 4th, and it is only four short sessions. So something to, to look forward to. Um, next, I'd like to pl put in a plug for the upcoming U of M alum entry level job fair, which is on which is hosted on June 9th from 2 to 5 p.m. And this is a virtual job fair. There are over 100 employers registered for this fair, so you definitely do not want to miss out on this opportunity. To learn more, you may go to the, the address on your screen. I will also uh, share with everyone who's registered today um, the, these addresses and information that I provided today. Um, so if you're tuning in right now and you might and you're interested in maybe listening by phone, you may do so by dialing 646-558-8658 and then when prompted dialing in the webinar ID, which is 952-264-9474. Additionally, if you have any questions at any time, you may drop those questions into the Q&A. Um, you can also drop them into the chat and we reserve the last 30 minutes or so for those questions. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Annie to begin introducing herself. Hi, I'm Annie Montemayor. I am a career coach at the Carlson School of Management. Uh, currently, I work with undergraduate students, but I also have a lot of experience working with people who are further into their careers, um, pursuing graduate education, uh, specialized fields, and, and things like that. I'm happy to be here today. Hi everyone, my name is Marissa Smith and I'm the Director of Student and Recent Alumni Engagement at the University of Minnesota Alumni Association. And that means that I have the awesome opportunity to create uh, programs and resources that help students and recent alumni launch into their lives and careers. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erica Teeley. I am a career counselor in the College of Liberal Arts. I work principally with undergraduate students and I work with all students, uh, though I do work really closely with the language departments as well as global studies. I use she, her pronouns, and I am happy to be here today. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Jen Geyer Wood. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director and the MPA advisor at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs, which means I work with wonderful graduate and professional students, helping them to launch their careers and find internships and all that good stuff. But I've been in career development, working with all sorts of students and mid-career folks, career changers, and I'm so excited to be here with you today. Great, thank you and welcome everyone. Um, so before we get started, I'd like to go over what we'll be covering today. Um, we'll first start off with some quick job search strategies and key resources. Then we'll go into resources for building your network followed by um, information that you should know about, your, um, about a successful resume. And then we'll, finally we'll end with interviewing tips and strategies. And then we'll have 30 minutes at the end for your questions, questions um, that you might could drop in at any time in the chat or into the Q and A box. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to Annie. Hello. All right. So starting off with the job search tips, right? Where 
um, where do we actually find these jobs that we want to apply for? So first, I want to talk a little bit about just those basic logistics, right? Like, where do we find good postings? Um, what makes a good posting? And then I want to talk a little bit more about using technology to your advantage and um, finding tips to make your search efficient, right? Because this is kind of the first step is just finding um, what, uh, what you want to apply for and what works for you. All right, so um, you've probably heard of Handshake if you are a recent uh, student or uh, graduate. Uh, Handshake is a really great platform that we lean on a lot because it focuses on internships and then um, mainly entry level full time positions, which makes it a really good fit for um, recent graduates. So you're not going to find as many, you know, if you graduated five, six years ago and, and you have a little more experience, it might not be the best place for you, but you do still have access. Uh, to the to the platform. So Handshake is one um, great place to start if you're looking for more entry level positions. Another one uh, that I think a lot of people um, forget about kind of is industry specific job boards. So these might be, you know, on a website, uh, or they might be, you know, just someone's Twitter account or something like that, that kind of aggregates different job postings for a very specific industry. So it takes a little bit of digging and, and Google searching to find things like that. But if you can find a really good tailored one, that can be golden for your job search. Another place that, um, because we have so many kind of job board aggregators these days, sometimes we forget to actually look at company websites, right? And if it's a smaller company that's not doing mass recruiting or hiring or something like that, um, those may, that might be the only place you're seeing postings from that company. Um, LinkedIn, I think a lot of people probably use LinkedIn, right? It's super easy. You can apply real quick there. Um, and then other big ones are Indeed, Monster, uh, Career Builder, things like that. Now, those are those aren't bad places to search, but I do like to give a caveat that um, make sure you're a little careful because sometimes you will find more um, scams or kind of dead postings or things like that on those really big aggregators. Again, you know, on Handshake, um, employers are really vetted. So that's another reason why we really like Handshake. And that doesn't always happen on Indeed Monster Career Builder. Again, doesn't mean don't use them. It just means be careful, right? If something sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If they're asking for too much personal information or financial details, things like that up front, it's probably um, not a great posting to, to spend your time on or to offer any information to. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is um, staffing agencies. And I guess that's not really a, a place to find job postings, but I think staffing agencies can be underrated and we suggest, you know, use our vetted list. Um, you can reach it at that Z link there, z.umn.edu slash staffing agencies. We've got them for a whole bunch of different industries there and that one's linked um, to the uh, College of Liberal Arts uh, website. But um, staffing agencies can be a good way to just get going, get started, get into a company. And I always like to remind people, you know, once you, you can get in and get to know people, when something more permanent opens up, um, that, you know, they've already seen your work, right? They already know who you are, and that can make you um, an even stronger candidate to, um, to move in there internally then. All right, and now on to um, some of the, the tricks and tips to uh, make the most of your time uh, job searching. So a lot of you may know about these um, job search agents. All right, so it, it, that, that's some really official verbiage for, you know, setting up um, an email reminder, right? When a new uh, when a new job posting comes out on LinkedIn, you can go. You know, if you search jobs, there's up in the right hand corner. There's a little toggle, and you can set it to um, set job alert for it, right? So that means when um, when a new job is posted that meets your search requirements, you're going to get an email, or depending on the website, you can even set up texts and things like that. Um, to be alerted when a new job that meets your criteria comes in. So on LinkedIn, right, that might um, be that uh, set job alert on Handshake. It's, uh, it's like save search. You'll see that after searching for things. And you can do that on, on almost any uh, job search site. 
So the reason we suggest that is because then you don't have to feel like you're constantly going between a whole bunch of different websites, checking to see what's new, checking to see if a job has closed, anything like that, right? This kind of makes some technology do some work for you, right? So those job search agents or whatever you want to call them, you know, setting job alerts, um, setting, saving searches, things like that. That's a great way to keep you up to date. Um, then that really ties into my last point there, which is around setting a schedule because um, the, w- the way that job alerts help is that, you know, if you feel like you're always trying to just fit in some job searching in between different tasks, in between other work classes, whatever it might be, it can feel like you're just overwhelmed by the job search, right? Because the job search is really difficult as it is, and it can feel all consuming, right? We think of it kind of like studying for a test. You're, you're never really done studying until you've taken the test. And with the job search, it's a little bit like that. You're, you're never done doing work. There's always more that you can do until you get the job, right? So to help combat that, we suggest setting a schedule, right? Set time aside and, you know, a good chunk, right? Two or three hours, right? So you can really focus in, really commit, right? So set your schedule. Say it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight to 10, right? Know what you're going to tackle each day. So maybe Monday, it's going through those job search emails, deciding which ones you want to apply for. Tuesday, maybe it's starting to prepare those resumes and gathering any additional information. Friday, you're actually submitting the applications. And maybe you're also like following up on previous applications that you sent in, right? Add structure to it and it feels less overwhelming. And then I'll go kind of, I'll backtrack there and talk a little bit about keywords, right? So those keywords are what you're going to be using probably a little bit with those job search agents to find the best listings. So it's important to remember that a job title is not always the best way to search because a financial analyst at company A might actually look really different from what a financial analyst at company B does. So keep that in mind, that job titles aren't always the best. So focus on keywords um, that really can be anything. It might be, you know, a certain kind of software that's really common in this particular type of job. It might be a certain kind of, um, you know, data modeling or something like that, right? It can be anything, but it's a keyword that you see continuing to show up in job postings. And it, it's a little bit of a, you know, searching and, and trial and error. But once you find it, that's when you set that job search alert, right? So that it, it automates the system a little bit more. So those are my tips for job search. And I look forward to any more uh, questions from you on it during the Q&A. But uh, right now we'll move on to networking. All right, Uh, moving on to networking. What a loaded word. I know that when anyone mentions the word networking, a lot of different feelings and opinions can come up. So the first thing that I wanna do is invite those of us on the call to drop a word or two into the chat. What comes up for you when you hear the word networking? Uh, What does the idea of networking make you think, feel, believe? What are some opinions or ideas that you have about networking? And right now, just drop those into the chat. And I wanna use those as a way to both kind of ground our conversation, then maybe also hopefully reframe the conversation. So I'm not seeing anything yet, but I know that, um, oh, here we go. Small talk, insincere, sometimes forced, conversations, relationships, social, stressful for introverts. All of these are, so spot on, overwhelming, lively. Um, These are great. Some of the things that I had written down that I've heard over the years are insincere, forced, transactional. Um, And for the times that I've been involved in networking, I've seen really a wide array of um, styles of networking and kind of takeaways. And so what I'm hoping to leave you with during this section is the idea that Um, networking is really about building community and about educating yourself on different career paths. So if you're somebody that's coming into this conversation a little overwhelmed about the idea of networking or unsure where to start, 
um, maybe put to the side this idea that it's um, that you have to be something that you're not in order to participate in networking. Um, it is widely seen as the number one way to get a job. So Annie just shared with us a bunch of wonderful job search strategies. And now the networking is a way to take all of those strategies to the next level and help make sure that you can be as successful as, uh, as you can be um, in your job search. So what are some different ways of networking? You probably have heard of some of the big ones, things like events, simply meeting new people at in-person or virtual gatherings, sharing who you are, what you're looking to do, and gaining valuable contact information that you can use. Um, referrals is probably one of my personal favorites, and this is asking your existing contacts for advice on new people to explore, um, or get to know. I will never forget that my very first job at the University of Minnesota um, came to me because my very first job as a teenager, uh, my, my supervisor there knew the HR manager at the University of Minnesota. She knew I was looking um, at the University of Minnesota and uh, she was looking out for me in a way that I never would have imagined. And that, that came from networking. There's also online search tools, and we'll talk a little bit more about a big one that's available to you as a University of Minnesota student and alum in just a minute. Some other ways to build your network that you may have already thought about are student organizations. So if you're joining this call as a student, um, you have uh, access to groups with shared mutual interests or career goals, seek them out and, and get connected to industry experts that way. Professional associations. So the professional industry areas have many times have associations that you can plug into for educational and networking opportunities. And then last, but certainly not least, are alumni networks. So you, uh, as a University of Minnesota community member, are connected to an alumni community that is half a million people strong. And that is incredibly powerful. When I meet alumni out in the world doing amazing things, there is nothing that they wouldn't do to help a fellow University of Minnesota student or alum along in their career path. And so if you're not already utilizing your alumni network, this is something to start thinking about strategically starting today. And you're not on your own. You might be thinking, okay, with half a million alumni, where on earth do I even start to find these connections that are supposedly so valuable? Well, the Alumni Association has created a tool that makes it really easy to reach out and find alumni who are willing to help in very specific and tangible ways. It's called the Maroon and Gold Network. And first, we're going to watch just a really short video introduction is what the Maroon and Gold Network is. And then I'll break it down a little bit for you as to how to get started. Looks like the video might have started over there, so I'll spare you from having to watch it again. But what I hope you took away from that video is that we've created a digital platform that makes it really easy for you to seek out alumni, get to know their interests, their, their area of focus, and then reach out to them for advice. So you can reach out to alumni on the Maroon and Gold Network for help with choosing a major. If you're a student and maybe you're unsure what you want to study, um, you can talk to alumni who have been in your shoes, who have gone through that process of choosing a major, switching a major, and get advice on that. You can talk to them about resumes and cover letters. Maybe they're in a position where they're hiring um, other positions, and they've had a chance to review cover letters and resumes. They have that hands-on 
experience um, and can tell you things that have stuck out to them. Maybe you can reach out to them for job search strategies um, and get advice as to how they were successful in navigating their different career transitions. The Maroon and Gold Network has over 9,000 users on it. Um, 5,600 of them are alumni. So there's bound to be someone that uh, you're interested in connecting with. Many, many, many users on the Maroon and Gold Network are recent grads from the last 10 years. And this is exciting because when I talk to students and recent alumni, they talk about, while there's of course value in talking to people who have several decades of experience, there's also real benefits to talking to somebody who's just a few steps ahead of you um, and have, has a good memory of what it's like, you know, graduating college and maybe being a little unsure about what's next. Um, and using networking to their advantage to find out what's going to be that first opportunity for them out of college or that second opportunity for them out of college. This is another exciting aspect about the Maroon and Gold Network is that it is global. So there are alumni in nearly every state in the, in the country and also in 46 countries. So if you are looking to stay here in the Twin Cities after graduation, you're in luck. That's obviously where most of our alumni are. Um, but you, if you're looking to go out west or out east or to Chicago or Florida or Texas, there are going to be people on the Maroon and Gold Network that you can find that live there that can help guide you as you get familiar with that location. So hopefully I've convinced you about the value of the Maroon and Gold Network, um, but just in case you need a little bit more, um, here's a couple of quotes from students and alumni on the Maroon and Gold Network. And I know this is a lot to read, but I just wanna read um, what Brock has to say about his experience on the Maroon and Gold Network, because I think it really gets to the heart of networking in general, and then also what we're trying to do with this platform. So it says the University of Minnesota prepares all graduates by providing tremendous education in any field, but there will always be unforeseen lessons that can only come from hands-on experience. And the Maroon and Gold Network helps bridge that gap. So if you're looking to bridge the gap in terms of understanding how your education and your skills and your experiences can help you in the job hunt, in the job market, the Maroon and Gold Network can be a really good thing to check out um, and a really great way to get introduced to networking in a really friendly, warm environment since everybody on there is a University of Minnesota grad and has specifically signed up to help you and your peers in this way. Um, so if you have any questions about the Maroon and Gold Network or networking in general, I'll be very happy to take those at the end of the presentation. Um, but that brings us to our next session, which is resumes. I got so excited to speak, I didn't realize <laughs> you couldn't hear me or see me. My kids just got home, they baffled me. Okay, so how do you stay out of the no pile? There's really two important things to remember. One is writing strong skill statements. So those skill statements are the bulleted statements on your resume. And you, and we'll talk about more, that more in a second. And then the second one is tailoring. And per mo, what just Marissa said about networking, networking really gives you some good insights into what employers are seeking. And through those conversations, you can really um, highlight certain skills and statements in there. And then for online submissions, you want to save it in a PDF. That way the format and margins don't shift and what they get is what they get. Mm -hmm. um, and also you wanna make sure that how you title your resume, it's very descriptive. So you could put your last name and your first name. What I even did when I was really heavy job seeking as I finished grad school was I even put in the name of the organization because I didn't wanna accidentally send the wrong one. And having been on enough search committees, let me tell you that many people frequently do not take care um, to pay attention. And sometimes it is those little details. Okay. So what makes a good skill statement? So first, one of the biggest mistakes I see as a career counselor is that people talk about tasks instead of really talking about skills because they're not hiring you for doing everyday tasks. They're hiring you for the skills that you have. 
Um, another one is to have specific details, including quantifying in those bulleted statements when you can. So how many people did you supervise? How many students did you work with? Um, what was the percentage of increase of volume or sales or what have you? So it could be related to people, related to productivity. Uh, additionally, you wanna be concise. Um, but also make it unique. You don't, you want to give enough detail and information and also in that uniqueness, you want to customize and make sure that it is for that specific position and not just um, for any, any could be for any job. Um, and that really does come through for employers, whether or not you've customized it for that position or not. Um, additionally, you want to show um, those skills and contextualize. So bringing in that second bulleted statement, sub quantification, and that again, that and that'll take you from I said tasks to skills. So um, how complex was it? What did you do? And I have in the next slide, I have an example of what that can look like. Um, and then what are the results? If you're telling me you've got these skills, but not telling me what the end result was, I'm not really getting that information or really that contextualization again. Um, and the fact that you were able to have an impact on that organization with which you were working or interning or volunteering or what have you. And then, whoops, um, then you wanna demonstrate an understanding of the purpose and roles and duties. So again, taking in what you learned from networking, researching on the website, um, looking at the job description itself and that customization piece I've already referred to. Um, so about 50% of your effort and your resume should go into making the skill statements that accompany your experience and any activities sections you have on your resume the best they can possibly be. And for employers, they were asked a question from NACE, which is the National Association of Colleges Employers, what most, most needs improvement with students is resumes. And the top three things were not customization for the position, the quality of the writing, and poor visual appeal or hard to read format. So keep those in mind because it does happen often. So save it in PDF to avoid that format piece. Really look at your resume once, two, three times, share it with someone. And that customization piece becomes glaringly obvious very quickly. Okay, so how do we put together strong skill statements? Because like I just said, put in about 50% of the time. So first you want to have um, a strong action verb. So um, I linked it here. I think you'll get, get it afterwards. Um, otherwise you can just search action verbs um, on any of our career services sites. And so that could be collaborate. And, and a, a present tense position should be in present, past, past. That is a really common mistake that happens a lot. But you want to have those strong verbs. Um, and then you want to think about those details. Who, what, where, how, why, very, you know, those very classic questions. But it is really important to, again, details and contextualization. And then thinking about what are those skills and competencies did you use? And again, tie it back to the job description. And again, what populations did you work with? Like I mentioned, did you work with students? Did you work with data? Did you work with, uh, did you work by yourself? Um, and, and really, how did you do it? More information. And then I talked about quantification. And then finally, really focusing on those results. Like I said earlier, um, how did you make an impact and how are you demonstrating it here in this concise way? Okay. Let's try again. Okay. Oh my word. Okay. So, like I said earlier, sometimes people will talk about tasks instead of skills. So you might say, "I was responsible for data," or "responsible for data" as your bulleted statement. Instead, how does this sound? Analyze the annual property tax data and data for inclusion in office county report for residents. It really makes a big difference from the employer's point of view you're demonstrating that you are using those analytical skills, that you're using certain technology like Stata, who are you serving and what did it do? Okay, so this resume employer survey results. So these are, I gave you some results earlier for, um, for a national survey, and this is a survey of U of M employers. And here's some things they said about resumes. So one, I like to see tangible results on resumes, 
so you saved your company money in your internship, how much? If you completed a project ahead of time, by how much time? Again, um, what is the benefit to the employer for hiring you and what can you bring with you from those past experiences? Um, another one. Come on. There we go. Hiring managers want to see what they can expect you to accomplish for them based upon what you've accomplished in other positions. Uh, so focus on how your skills can help the organization grow. And finally, go ahead and sell yourself a bit. So, you know, really, it's, I think sometimes, especially if you're based in the Midwest or have some of that culture, it feels like you're bragging, but really you want to demonstrate to your full capacity who you are and what you can bring and show those results. So something to help paint a picture of what the heck you did, how you did it, what you liked and why it's relevant. Okay, so talked about a tailored resume. So you wanna format, that's really important as well. So you wanna have it be visually appealing, break it apart. That's by using bold, italics, um, font. You really shouldn't use more than like one, maybe two fonts. I'd say um, an exception to that would be if you're more in a design field. And then the order of your bullet points. So you know, we, we read top, bottom, left to right. And so um, you want to really put the most important bulleted statements at the top because you don't know if the, the some re, um, employers really skim. So you wanna make sure that you're putting your most important, most impactful, and those that are most related to the position at the top. Okay. Um, and then tailoring it to a job or internship application. For the content, you really want to um, think about which experiences and statements to include. Sometimes I see people who have similar roles with different organizations repeat the same things over and over. If you did like a serving role, for example, in college um, at a few different organizations, if you were able to train in people in one area and do more customer service communications in another, break that apart and show those in different areas. Or if it's same across the board, you don't need to add everything. Um, and in fact, from a legality standpoint, you, I think some students think you have to, or alumni think you have to include it, and you just don't. OK. Um, what else? Um, word choice. So again, those keywords in that Annie mentioned earlier in the job that you're looking for, or the internship, you wanna match those in the job description as much as possible. It's easier on the eye, especially for either human eyes who are looking at it, it's easier to pick out those certain words, or sometimes it'll be run through a system and it'll look for those key words. So I think we've been conditioned throughout college not to plagiarize, but in this case, it's really easier for the system to recognize that you qualify. And then for the organizational structure. So there's different headers. It could be related experience, leadership experience, other experience, volunteerism, um, extracurriculars, student involvement. Pick headers that fit your experience plus what the organization is seeking. So um, that way you can order it and have those most relevant experiences at the top like we talked about earlier. Okay. Um, here are some examples. So psychology, advocacy, leadership, campus and community involvement. Um, you don't want to have too many categories because then you won't have enough time to extrapolate on your set of experiences. You want to make it easy for the reader to see your experiences as relevant and unique. And then also you want to list experiences in reverse chronological order within each header. Okay, so here we can see the, um, how easy and attractive it can be, how everything lines up. This is kind of a, it's kind of hard to read, but really want you to look at the keywords, really want you to look, or I'm sorry, the headers. You wanna see the name that's nice and big, um, and you wanna fill the whole page and you don't wanna have, there's a lot of folks who tend to have a lot of um, blank spots. You wanna take up as much white space as possible. Um, a last word is you really want to be careful with graphics and color. Use it sparingly and use it when it's appropriate. So that is all I have, and I'm happy to answer additional questions at the end of the session. Thank you. All right, so talk about lightning talks, right? This was a lot of information really quick, but if you were listening to the great advice and the information and resources that you heard from Annie and Marissa and Erica, and you did all of this, 
then you've probably landed an interview or two or more than that. And so now is the time that you'll have to prepare for interviews. So I'm gonna very quickly in the next seven or so minutes, talk to you about some basic good tips that everybody can use for interviewing. So I wonder if you would be willing to pop in the chat, um, uh, just a yes or a hey or me, if you get nervous about interviewing. I wanna see how many of you get a little bit nervous about interviewing. All right, I'm getting some and I am popping in myself because yes, I still get nervous about interviewing myself. And so some of these tips that we share, yep, yep, lots of yeses. Some of these tips that we share might help that, but it's always okay to have a little bit of excitement and nerves when you're interviewing. Oops. There we go. So what we're gonna focus on is four steps to a successful interview. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the preparation piece because that's something that you can control ahead of time. But we're also going to talk about kind of testing things out, especially a lot of interviews are still being held virtually right now. Not all of them, but many of them are. And so there's some testing that you might wanna do. We'll talk a little bit about what happens during the interview. And then the last thing we'll talk about is follow up. And so really the piece that I want you to keep in mind, I want you to think like an employer. So when you're doing your resumes, the information that Erica shared with you were things from an employer's perspective, what they were looking for, what helps them to choose you to interview. And that's how you need to approach the interview process as well. Remember, employers are trying to assess how your competencies, your skills, your experiences, and your qualifications match the position, okay? So they are really laser focused on that position and their needs. And that's how you need to work as you prepare. Um, they're considering your fit with the organization as well. So your goal is to really communicate all of this really well. So let's start and talk a little bit about the preparation piece. Oops, I'm sorry. I messed up, I'm gonna hit present and we'll see if this works. My um, keyboard got a little bit extra happy. All right, so prepare. The first step is to obtain information about the interview. And this is something that some people are afraid to do. So they might get a call or an email and they might, they talk to me about how do I prepare for this interview? I don't know who's gonna be interviewing me. I don't know how long it's gonna be. I don't really know what this is all about. So it's okay to ask a few questions. Now you don't wanna grill them. But it's okay to ask how long the interview might be and who will be interviewing you. That helps you to discern what type of interview it is. So there are interviews that you might consider a screening interview. Those are usually really short. I've seen them anywhere between 10 minutes and a half an hour. A lot of times these days they're on the phone. They might be a video interviews, but a lot of times they're just a quick interview. And the employer is trying to discern um, whether you move on to the rest of the process. So they may ask about things like if the salary that they're offering is appropriate, um, why you want the position. And so they're just really trying to see if um, you're a fit at this point, if you meet the minimum qualifications, and then they'll move you on for a more rigorous interview. So you kind of want to know what type of interview you're preparing for, who's going to be there, and that sort of thing. Um, so you also wanna research the organization. And there are lots of ways to do this. And I want to kind of open your mind as you think about that. So of course there's the organization's website. That's an awesome place to look. You can also look on LinkedIn. Most um, medium to large organizations and even some small ones have a special page on LinkedIn that, that has a lot of information, including people that work there, um, news releases, all sorts of great stuff that can help you to prepare for your interview. A Google search is also great as well. I, when I'm helping students and graduates and alumni, one of the places that I look is Glassdoor. So if they say, Jen, I need help preparing for an interview and I'm interviewing at this organization, sometimes you can actually see what the interview questions are like and what the process is like on Glassdoor. So you can get a leg up on that. Another thing that I want you to think about is your intel from your networking. So all the great stuff that Marissa was talking about and the connections that you have, your fellow alums and everyone, if you know somebody who interviewed there or if you know somebody who works there, they might give you a little bit of information as well. Finally, think about who's interviewing you. You can look them up on LinkedIn, that's okay. And so you understand the types of questions that they might be asking or their, their um, perspectives. 
Next, you want to analyze that position and any additional information you had. So if somebody referred you, if you talked to a recruiter, or you talked to somebody who worked there, analyze it and think about what it is that that employer is looking for. Remember what I said earlier, what do they need to know about me? And we're going to focus on the rest of this list as I go through the rest of the slides. Prepare your star story. Some of you may know what that is, so I'll review that for you and introduce it to folks who don't. You'll want to develop a list of questions that, to ask the interviewers. One big tip that I have is never walk away from a, a, the opportunity to ask the interviewer questions. Many interviewers, many employers tell us that if a, if a student or a graduate or an alum is interviewing with them and they don't have any questions, they perceive that, that may not, this may not be true, but they perceive it as you're not interested. And so you wanna make sure that you have some great questions for them. Determine what you'll wear and make your traveler technology plans. So let's move along and talk a little bit more about a couple of these items. I'm trying so hard not to click it twice that it's not clicking at all for me. <laughs> there we go. So test and practice, that's really an important piece for technology. I had an interview that was a virtual interview many years ago that went off the rails because my computer died in the middle of it. But luckily I had my iPad there ready to go and I just logged in and it started again and they were all really impressed that I was able to do that so quickly. So if you're conducting a virtual interview, make sure you test your computer and the software. So we are a Zoom campus and a lot of students and new graduates are pretty used to using Zoom. I've helped a number of people recently who have had interview requests on Microsoft Teams. And what I do is I have a, a Teams account set up. So if somebody wants to test it out with me, I'm happy to do that. So that way they know what it looks like, how it works, how to adjust the volume. So test out those things. Make sure your background looks appropriate. That's really important. Um, it, it, if you need to go to a different place than you usually are, um, some things are opening up on campus for current students or recent grads, you might even be able to get a space that's quiet on campus to interview, but make sure that you have an appropriate background. If you're interviewing in person, um, determine how you're gonna get there, do a test run. For example, if you're interviewing at eight or 8.30 in the morning, the traffic might be pretty bad. And so you wanna test that out to make sure that you're there a little bit early, that you know where to park, that you're not nervous about how you're gonna get there. Now, of course, the clothes, what do you wear? Um, it's so strange, things have changed so much in the Zoom environment, but I'm still hearing from employers, they, they expect you to take it up a notch when it comes to interviewing via Zoom and they expect the same thing with interviewing in person. So I'm sorry, the sweatpants or stretch pants and the tennis shoes or flip flops probably aren't gonna work if you're gonna interview in person. And in either way, you want to be in business or business casual, depending on the type of interview that you're interviewing for and the organization, usually a collared shirt, um, a, a suit jacket, maybe a tie, depending on the types of places that you're interviewing for. Practice. This is another thing that can really help those nerves. So interview stream is a great system that's available through Handshake. And um, again, students and recent grads know about that, but we can help you get started on Handshake if you're an alum who's been out for a little bit. And um, you can practice that way. LinkedIn also has some free resources for interview prep. And you can also, if, you're, uh, if you have a premium membership, you can see some sample answers, but you can practice right using LinkedIn. So these are really, really useful tools that are available for you. Okay, star strategy. I hope a lot of you have heard about the star strategy. This is my favorite thing. And this is why I love talking about interviewing. It works so well for so many reasons. It helps to get at the nerves. It helps you to feel prepared. It helps you to be strategic. It helps you to um, make sure your answers aren't too long or too short. So the what my, where I recommend that you do for every interview, take a step back. What are the skills and experiences that this employer is looking for? So you look at the required qualifications, the preferred qualifications, and you determine those skills. And for each of them, think of an example, concrete examples, uh, evidence of something you've done in the past when you've successfully done that. And then you describe using the STAR framework. So I'm going to rush through this just a little bit because I know we want to leave time for questions. But the STAR technique is situation, task, action, and result. So you describe the situation and what you had to do. That's the situation task. Action is what did you actually do? And the results is how it turned out. So this example is talking about somebody who is an executive director. They had to manage a budget and do fundraising and they discovered they were not meeting the financial goals of their gala. 
Um, so that's the situation and it was impacting their overall budget. The task was they had to increase their income by 80% or eliminate the gala. The action, they developed a short survey to send to members to ask for ideas to improve the gala. They used that feedback. They did a financial analyst analysis and they gathered the planning team and made a strategy to improve the gala. Result, remember what Erica was talking about with quantifying? So this person's quantifying. They said they in decreased expenses by 25,000 yearly, increased their revenue um, in two different percentages for the first and second year. So you can see how this would be really impactful for an employer. So finally, I'm gonna wrap up really quickly. I strongly encourage you all to send a thank you, a personal I thank you. Um, with things kind of still being in person and virtual, I recommend email and I recommend a very quick email. Um, so please follow up after every interview. And now I'm going to turn it over to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Jen. That was wonderful. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Erica and Marissa. So if folks have questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box or into the chat. We did have a question that came in earlier during Erica's presentation on resumes from Brianna. Um, her question is, how much should you customize for each job? Um, Brianna doesn't want to spend too much time um, and overdo it. Yeah, I would say that if you're applying to very similar positions over and over again, I would just be mindful of the changes that you're making. I would say even more so in the cover letter than in the resume, um, though look at it again and again because you might be adding certain things that aren't relevant to that position. So sometimes it's minor things. And if you're applying, especially for entry level positions, um, and it could be in a few different industries or areas that, um, yeah, you just wanna be mindful of when you're making big changes and small changes. Sometimes it doesn't matter as much, but making those small changes will really edge you to the top of the pile as well. Great. Brianna says, thank you. <laughs> so another question came in. Um, for matching terms, terms from the job description to the resume, should we keep the form of the word? For example, analyze versus analytical. What are your thoughts there? Analyze. Mm -hmm. It's analyze. more active anyway. Yep. Mm -hmm. If you're describing something that, you know, like the result it took, that's where I would start using your adjectives. Yeah, I, th I think they're trying to get at like, doesn't need to be exact match for it to be picked up and recognized as a, as the, as the right skill that they're looking for. That is a good question. Anyone else? That is a great question. Yeah, I would say I typically, so I think it, if I'm thinking in terms of like ATS software that's reading your resume, um, typically they're going to put in like it's going to have multiple multiple versions of the word so if they're looking for somebody with like strong analytical skills they're going to have both analyze and analytical plugged in there to search for it um so i don't know that i i don't think that the exact form matters too much they the the software is typically going to see that and if you're if you're thinking in terms of humanized reading it um the, you know they're gonna recognize that too. Great. The next question is, um, where, where can we find job postings and what are some keywords to find industry specific job boards? So any uh, suggestions there about finding job boards? Yeah, so a couple ideas and I'll start, but I'm sure other people have some, some thoughts, but I can't remember who mentioned it, but um, thinking of those uh, professional associations. So, um, you know, thinking like the uh, like National Association of Accountants or whatever, you know, those professional associations, oftentimes they have like a career page on their professional association website. So if you start by looking like, um, you know, uh, 
professional associations for marketing or whatever it might be, you're going to start finding relevant professional associations. And from there, you can look at those websites and look for their career page or they, you know, they might call it a job board, whatever it might be. And um, that's one place where you can find those job boards. But a lot of times too, um, like, I mean, I think, for example, like higher ed jobs or things like that, if you literally just um, kind of take your industry and, and do some searching around like jobs, job boards, um, job postings, anything like that, sometimes they're on Twitter, sometimes they're a website, um, they can be, you know, they can be housed kind of different ways. Um, but that's generally a really good way to find those. Anybody else have ideas? Oh, yeah, I know that Career Force has a, um, a search engine for professional jobs, uh, professional associations, and I can share that resource um, afterwards as well. Yeah, they kind of have a directory there for folks. Another thought that comes to mind, I know we mentioned LinkedIn earlier, but you can often find these professional associations on LinkedIn and follow them there. You can also find other uh, industry-related groups for job seekers in LinkedIn as well. Um, so those may be other, some other great resources there to kind of help you narrow in on your job search. And I would add to the U of M library system has librarians focused on different areas of industries yeah. and there's some really good databases where you can search by industry. So that would be another place I'm trying to find it right now. And once I do, I will also put that in the chat. So it looks like we have some questions here about CV versus resume. So I'm trying to tease out what the question is here. Um, so they're asking about, you know, CV versus resume, are there valuable things that one would have on their CV that they should carry over to their resume? And I'm happy to chime in too here. Yeah, go start, Rebecca. Okay. Yeah, I would say when it comes to CV versus resume, you know, your CV is very academically focused, publications, presentations, um, all, and a lot of your um, research experience in an academic setting. Whereas your resume is more focused on the skills and qualifications, but you can carry over relevant publications or presentations to your resume if you wish to do so. And when it comes to like your experience, I'd really tease out like the skills um, that you carried, um, that you uh, utilize while doing a particular research project. And talking about like, you know, maybe you worked in a team of five people to do X, Y, and Z, and this was the result of that project. Um, so really being really tangible in terms of the results of that project um, and keeping it in, in, a, in a much shorter format. A CV can be many, many pages, whereas a resume is usually one to two pages um, max. Okay. Yeah, I think that experience. Yeah, I was just gonna say, that's a really good point, Rebecca. If you think of it kind of like, you know, if you're a veteran coming into the civilian workforce, um, if you think of it like that, like, a the general workforce isn't necessarily going to know like what um, what went into you getting published for that academic paper or something like that. Um, it, just like a veteran, the civilian workforce doesn't necessarily know like what all you did as a sergeant or whatever it, it was. Um, so making it more clear and really focusing on those skills, if you, it's really similar to to veterans in the workforce. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. There's a lot of work there to be, you know, in terms of translating that experience and really focusing on those relevant key experiences. I think that's part of the, the, the hard work there is kind of teasing out what are those relevant experiences that you want the other person to know about your experience. Um, another question here, how can we find jobs after the summer internships have been filled um, have been filled on the online posting. So like this, after, you know, all the summer jobs or internships have been filled, what, what are your next, what are some next steps or resources one could do, could utilize? I can start. Oh, go Erica. Oh, I will. So I was going to, I just had this question earlier this week in a student appointment and it's actually really amazing. Our employer relations staff who work directly with employers are telling us they're like, we can't, we can't get enough people to apply. We still have a lot of job openings. So sometimes it's about the way in which you're searching for jobs or internships. And 
so one, if you're not sure how to do that, that would be where you could meet with, with a career staff as well. But sometimes two different searches, like on Handshake, for example, if you search job role and you search industry, you actually cancel each of those experience or options out and you have less um, options to search for. Um, so um, broaden your search a little bit is the first thing I would say. Two, relevant, relevant experience is relevant experience. So um, having a summer job, volunteering. Um, so you could go to the Center for Community Engaged Learning, for example, um, do those networking, see who, who you know who might be looking for something. There's so many remote opportunities right now that you could be looking into as well. So don't just search location as Minneapolis, Minnesota or wherever you're currently located, think more broadly than that. Um, so those are a few other ideas that I currently have, but I'll pass the torch on to someone else. Yeah, I was just gonna echo what Erica said about thinking like relevant experience is relevant experience. And I had a student today that I was working with and encouraging them to just kind of reframe because I think there's a lot of emphasis for students put on that idea of an internship. And if you can reframe the way you think of that because it doesn't have to be an internship. It's really just about gaining experience. So just like Erica said, if it's volunteering or a part-time job, that's still valid experience. It doesn't have to be specifically named an internship to be um, important. Yeah, I, I want to put in another plug for networking and the Maroon and Gold Network here too, because all the alumni on the Maroon and Gold Network have, have been asked to specify exactly how they're willing to help. So it might be introductions to others in their field or job shadowing opportunities. And so those to me signal um, some very hands-on ways to get exposed to opportunities. Now you might've heard that there's a little bit of a dance that has to happen in networking in the sense that when you first reach out, you're not supposed to directly ask for a job, right? That that's seen as um, rude or inappropriate in the, in the very first contact. However, everybody knows that career networking is largely for that purpose. So have the informational interview, be curious and see where it goes. Um, because you'll be surprised when the people that you've networked with get a job posting forwarded to them, they're going to remember you and forward it to you, or they're going to have a contact or two or three that they want you to meet with next. And it might not be that first circle that has the job opportunities, but it's going to be that next circle or the next circle. So networking is a great way to feel like you're making progress in this area and, and get closer to that end goal. I really agree with Marissa. I think networking is really important. I also agree with Erica. Our employers are still looking for interns and we have folks still looking for our RAs for our graduate students. So there are still opportunities out there, but, but your networking can help. Some students build their own internships. Some students find other sorts of opportunities. I just was working with a a graduate yesterday who told me that their mentor pretty much um, landed in an in internship for them. So your network can be so important, especially if you feel like you're struggling a little bit. Great. Yes. And sometimes, it, you know, you mentioned like things don't have to exactly look like a formal internship. They can be projects, um, you know, even looking at small startups, startup organizations and reaching out to those organizations to see if there's any projects you can take on for them um, that they may not be able to take on themselves. So that might be another good idea good idea to explore. Well, it looks like we don't have any questions left. Oh, and Erica mentions Parker Dewey um, as a resource for finding short-term projects um, with employers. So that's another resource that we'll share out afterwards with everyone. 